place that we never, ever expected to be. My guess is there's not one of us in this room who doesn't know what it's like to have life come at us this way and be disappointed and discouraged as a result, who, who doesn't know what it's like to have dreams that didn't pan out the way we anticipated or thought or imagined they would. I, I guess I should say happy Easter to you too. I kind of got into things and... Um, but, but the reason I wanted to, uh, to start out this way is, is because, you know, you know, Easter, yeah, when we think about Easter, we think about breakthrough, we think about newness, we think about new life, new clothes. I remember as a kid that, that, that my mom used to, every Easter, dress my younger brother and me in these matching outfits that we would, you know, break out on Easter Sunday morning. In fact, if you were to go in the bedroom at my parents' house in Oklahoma City, on the wall are these two big pictures of my brother and me in, uh, in these Easter outfits. And no, they're not going to show up on the slide behind me. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but how many of you, as you think back on your childhood, were similarly afflicted by your parents as a kid? A number of us, yeah. Um, you know, Easter's... Uh, Easter is about a, a new day with, with breathtaking opportunities, about victorious possibilities, about you know, positive prospects of the future. Easter is not about frustrated ambitions or, or, or dashed dreams or, or broken promises. But yet, if you're really going to experience the truth about Easter, you need to realize that that first Easter morning didn't begin with a sense of excitement and exhilaration in the hearts and lives of those that were followers of Jesus. If you read the scripture, the day began with a few women crying in a graveyard. It began with some ladies who were, who were feeling the full weight of their shattered dreams and their, their crushed aspirations. And so what I, I, I want us to begin our journey this morning at, at that place that those ladies began their journey on that first Easter morning. This place of sadness, this place of of heartache, this, this place of despondency. I want us to begin there and, and see if Scripture can't, can't lead us to a, to a more hopeful place. If you've got your Bibles, uh, John chapter 20 is where we're going to be. If, if you don't, the words are going to appear on the screen behind me in just a moment. But, but the account of Easter, uh, just set it up a little bit. The, the Easter account is, is captured in each of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. All four of them, of course, talk about Easter. They, they tell us what happened. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, well, let's just put it this way. J John offers some detail when he tells the Easter story. There, there's some richness to the story that Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't share with us. Matthew, Mark, and Luke kind of tell us what happened, but there's a sense in which John moves beyond what happened and teaches us how to live in light of what happened. And so I want us to look at John's gospel, John chapter 20. We'll, we'll pick it up at verse 10 this morning. And like I said, the words will appear on the screen if you don't have your Bibles with you. John chapter 20, beginning at verse 10. The, 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 it's Mary of Magdala has gone to the, the tomb and, and, and things have happened and I'll summarize those in a minute but picking me up the story at, at verse 10 it says then the disciples went back to their homes but Mary stood outside the tomb crying and as she wept she bent over to look into the tomb and she ta saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been one at the head, the other at the foot and they asked her, woman, why are you crying? And they've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. And at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And thinking it was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. 
And Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary of Magdala went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Leading up to what we just read, Mary of Magdala went to the tomb. And she saw that the stone had been moved to the side. And so she alerted Peter and John. And, and, and they ran to the tomb to, to see for themselves. And they went inside. And, and they saw that things were as Mary had said. In fact, that the scene is described in incredible detail in the verses leading up to the words I just read. You know, John said the, the, the linen in which Jesus' body's been placed, that it, that it was lying there, and the burial cloth that he'd been wrapped in, or that had been wrapped around his head, it was, it was neatly folded, and it was separate from the linen. You know, and Peter and John see this, and, 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 and they return home, which kind of leaves Mary there at the open tomb by herself. And she doesn't know what to make of things. And so she does the only thing that she knew to do in the midst of her confusion and bewilderment, and that was just to cry. Now, who was this Mary, this Mary of Magdala that went to the tomb that morning? You know, there's all kinds of ideas, there's all kinds of speculation that has grown up uh, around her. You know, a tradition going back to, the, I think, like the 7th or 8th century, it identifies her as the, as the prostitute from Luke chapter 7. That's the story where, where this lady breaks this alabaster jar of perfume, expensive perfume, and pours it on Jesus' feet and kisses them and wipes his feet with her hair. Now, now, there's nothing in Scripture to support this idea. That's just a, a tradition that's grown up. You know, many of you that are, that are my age or older remember the musical, the rock opera from the late 60s, early 70s, Jesus Christ Superstar. And in that, 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 in that production, Mary of Magdala is presented as this conflicted and, 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 and sensuous woman who's torn between uh, religious devotion and romantic attraction. You know, I don't know how to love him, she sings. In the novel, The Da Vinci Code, that was out a few uh, years back, that was popular a while back, Mary of Magdala is portrayed as Jesus' wife and, and the mother of his child. And so, again, none of these notions have any biblical or historical account or support at all. But there is one thing we can say about Mary of Magdala on the basis of the biblical record. If you look back to Luke chapter 8, if you look back to Luke chapter 8, she's mentioned there briefly, very beginning of the, ver or very beginning of the chapter, beginning verse 1. It says, After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, his disciples, the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons... Had come out. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others, these women were helping to support them out of their own means. So, so Luke is saying here that Mary of Magdala was one of several women who became followers of Jesus and to help support him in his ministry. And it also says that she was delivered from seven demons. And now, now we have no way of knowing what that meant for her. You know, we, we don't know what that was like. I mean, from other biblical accounts, demons could cause a person to you know, cut themselves, to, to, to throw themselves into a fire, to, to, to lose all manner of self-control. I mean, such people, many times they were either, they, they were locked up or they were somehow, some way isolated uh, from the rest of society. You know, we, don't, we don't know what Mary of Magdala's life was, but I think it's very safe to say at the very least that, that Jesus had delivered this lady from a very dark and disturbing past. 
He, he, he had set her free from a, an incredibly bleak and, and, and miserable existence. And now, suddenly, tragically, he's gone. He's dead. And, and my guess is that when, when, when the angels asked her in that 13th verse, when they sat there and asked her, woman, why are you crying? It was everything she could do to keep from saying, that's the most ridiculous question I've ever heard. Why should I not be crying? Because she said, they've taken my Lord away. And I don't know where they put him. And I want you to notice how she speaks of him there. Think about this. She speaks of Jesus as a person. It's not they've taken his body away. They've taken my Lord away. Because Jesus was the one who in many ways had given her her life back. The, the one who after years of untold torment had, had, had facilitated a breakthrough within her to where she was now able to dream again. But now because of the actions of a frightened, uh, insecure group of religious leaders, you couple that with a fickle and unfaithful crowd her dreams died. And she undoubtedly, I'm sure, wondered and asked and thought to herself, will those demons that previously haunted me, will they come back? What is the future without Jesus going to hold for me? I mean, she might as well have said to the to the angel that asked her that question, why are you crying? She might as well have said, they've taken my hope away. I don't know where they've put it. I don't know where to find it, but it's gone. Hope. What, what, is, what is hope? When you think about that word hope, is it, is it, is it naive optimism? Is it uh, w wishful thinking? You know? Hope it doesn't rain. We've got that outside activity planned. Oh, hope the stock market bounces back here before too long. Hope the sermon doesn't last too long. You know, those, those kinds of things. Hope. I was trying to get my mind around it, and, and so I went on dictionary.com and looked it up, and the definition of hope that it floated out there was the feeling that what is wanted can be had, or, or that events will turn out for the best. In other words, hope has an expectation of fulfillment. Hope begins, begins with this desire for something good, but it adds to it the element of expectation. I mean, without expectation, it's not hope, it's just a wish. And wishes, you know, we can, we can wish all we want, but wishes don't necessarily come true. But when we hope for something... There's a sense in which it's deeper and sense in which it's more embedded. When we hope for something, there's a sense in which we are counting on it. And in a very real sense, hope is hope's more than, than, than just a word. Hope is something that sustains us. Hope is something that, 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 that holds us up. It's something that, that, that when it's present, it changes our trajectory. It gets us to a better place. And when it's not present, it causes us to just sink like a rock to the bottom of the pond. I mean, when a team loses hope, game over. When investors lose hope, Stock market tanks. When a patient loses hope, death's on the doorstep. And here's my point. Here's what I'm trying to get at. Mary of Magdala had no reason to hope that morning when she went to the tomb. None. 
There, there wasn't the least bit of wishful thinking. There wasn't the, the least bit of naive optimism in her. She, she was resigned to a very grim and unpleasant task. She was going to embalm the dead body of the man that had done for her what she never thought was possible. The man who had given her her life back. And she'd watched him die. And she watched as he was laid to rest. And as far as she was concerned, it was over. And when she encountered the empty tomb that morning, that did not speak to her of resurrection. It spoke of thievery. It it spoke of robbery. It was just one more indignity in a long line of indignities that had played out over the previous 48 to 72 hours. Mary had no reason to hope that morning until while she was standing there she sensed that somebody else was standing there and she turned to see who it was and that individual asked her a question let's go back and revisit that part of the story picking it up John John chapter 20 at verse 14 It says that this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. And he said, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And thinking it was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I'll get him. She didn't recognize him at first. Maybe it was the the tears Maybe it was the, the, the dim morning light. But, but what's interesting, what's interesting to me is that the man she came to learn was Jesus. He asked her the exact same question the angels in the tomb had asked her just moments earlier. Woman, why are you crying? And I guess we shouldn't be all that surprised that, that, that Jesus, his, his first words to her were in the form of the question. I mean, Jesus didn't sit there and go, ta-da, it's me. He didn't say, hey, hey, Mary, need to stop crying. It's all good here, all good. He certainly didn't scold her for her lack of faith. He simply met her in the moment. He began by by, by asking her a question and then listening as she explained. He gave her time. He he gave her space. And in fact, there's a sense in which in which we need to give Mary credit for staying in the moment. I mean, I go back and look at the disciples whom she alerted when she found the open grave. They, they, they did the typical guy thing. You know, they, they, they raced each other to the tomb. And then they barge right in. And when they find it empty, they, they, they leave things there and go away. You know, nothing more to be done here. Might as well go get some breakfast, you know. But Mary stayed in the moment. And she met Jesus there. And I think there's something in this for us. I think there's something particularly as it relates to coming alongside friends and loved ones and folks that are struggling. I mean, when someone's hurting, when someone's discouraged, when someone's grieving, they they, they don't need happy talk. That they don't need religious cliches. They don't need you to sit there and say, you know, everything happens for a reason. Or, you know, they're in a better place now. Or or, or whatever doesn't kill you will only make you stronger. Folks, they don't need that because grief is real. Loss is painful. Unemployment stinks. And relationships can rip your heart out. And if someone in your world is hurting and you want to share hope with them, the best thing you can do is what Jesus did and just meet them in the moment. And let them share. You know, 
I ask him to tell you about it and just sit there and sit still long enough and just listen. Don't, don't rush to good news. The good news can wait. Jesus will still be there. I mean, I, 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 that's precisely what he did for Mary. He, he waited until she was ready. And then, ever so gently and ever so personally, he, he revealed himself to her. Again, picking up the story, verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me. For I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary of Magdala went to the disciples with the news, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he'd said these things to her. You know, I, I guess there was something about the sound of his voice or the... The, the, the mention of her name that, that sparked an awareness that triggered a cognizance to where she realized it's him. And she turned. And she said, Rabboni. That, that's a term that means teacher, but it's also a term of, of affectionate respect. And in that moment, in that moment, all, all, all the uncertainty, all the confusion vanished. She had reason to believe. She had reason to hope. There was a basis for hope. Because the one that she thought was dead was now alive. And the thing that I have you notice, the thing that's really interesting as I run this story around in my mind, is that it wasn't enough for Mary just to confront the evidence of the resurrection, because she'd already done that. She'd seen the empty tomb. She'd heard the, the, the angel's announcement. Uh, but those things weren't enough to convince her. What convinced her was a personal encounter with Jesus. An actual face-to-face -face interaction. A real meeting with him. That's what convinced her. And for any of us this morning that... That, that struggle with this whole faith thing, that struggle with this reality of the resurrection deal. I think we need the same thing. Because, folks, there's plenty of evidence. I mean, there's the empty tomb. And, and that's a claim that has never successfully been refuted, even though the religious leaders, they would have done almost anything to call the empty tomb into question. I mean, there's the evidence of the, the written record, both biblical and, and, and non-biblical. I mean, there's the great divide in human history, you know, B.C. to A.D. There's, there, there, there's the changed lives of the disciples, these cowardly, faint-hearted guys who, who ran for cover become these bold, confident, passionate proclaimers of Jesus in the weeks and months and years to come. And there's also the changed lives of people that you know. Folks, there's plenty of evidence. But like Mary, the evidence isn't enough. We need something personal. We need something experiential. We need an encounter with him of our own. And that's what Jesus offered Mary at the tomb. I mean, suddenly he was there and he was more real and more powerful and more glorious than she'd ever known him to be. And because of that, she had hope. Because Jesus was with her. 
He'd proven he was stronger than death. He was stronger than evil. That he was stronger than all those bad things that can happen in this world. And she must have, I, I guess she must have thrown her arms around Jesus at that point. Or you know, taken hold of his feet or, or something like that. Because he says, don't hold on to me. You know, in verse 17. And what he basically says in the, in the verses that follow, he says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still going to be with you, but it just won't be the same way as before. And he also says, I've got work for you to do. I've got a message for you to share. I want you to go and tell the disciples, tell the world, tell everybody you come in contact with that death is defeated. That I am risen. And according to verse 18, that is precisely what she did. And people are continuing to tell and share that news. A couple of millennia later. Here's the thing that I, that I think the Lord wants each of us to take away from today. If you remember nothing else, here's the thing I think that God wants us to hang our hat on this morning. Hope is not a what or a when or a why. Hope is a who. I mean, things don't just get better because we want them to. Things get better because someone does something. Somebody that's wise enough and strong enough and good enough to get us to that better place. And folks, Jesus is that someone for us. The resurrection proves that he's stronger than any setback or failure or loss or disappointment. If, if, if life has a way of killing dreams, Jesus has a way of bringing them back to life. And that's what hope is. It's the confidence that God can and will do something good regardless of how bleak or how desperate the circumstance might be. And so, folks, whatever, whatever circumstance you find yourself in this morning, whatever pain, whatever loss, whatever disappointment you may be dealing with, God can do something good with it or in it. And hear me, that doesn't minimize the pain, that doesn't minimize the loss, that doesn't minimize the evil of the situation. It simply means the story isn't over yet. That God can and will meet you in that moment, just as surely as he met Mary on that first Easter morning, because he's wise enough and he's strong enough to to do something that is good and meaningful and and eternally significant. So if you find yourself at a problematic and tough place right now, I want you, I want you to have the courage just to stay there. Just hang out in that place and invite Jesus to meet you there. He will. Or if you know somebody who's at that kind of a place right now, if you know somebody that's dealing with pain or loss or disappointment, then just be with them. Listen to them, pray for them. And when the time's right, share hope with them. Point them to Jesus. Because life has a way of killing dreams. But Jesus has a way of bringing dreams back to life. Life has a way of destroying our ambitions and desires, but Jesus has a way of reviving them. Hope. Hope isn't wishful thinking. Hope isn't this... uh, High in the sky hankering for wannabes or, you know, would-be pipe dreams. 
Hopeful living is confident living. Hopeful living is facing the future knowing that God can and will do something good. And Easter, the good news of Easter is that you have reason to hope. You have a go-ahead to hope. You don't have to live based upon the circumstances around you. You can live based upon the fact that something happened a couple thousand years ago that says God can overcome whatever. You have reason to hope because folks hope isn't a what hope isn't a when hope isn't a why hope is a who and specifically hope is the one that we celebrate and recognize this very day Melinda, would you come forward and lead us in the congregation? Would you stand? I want us to affirm the hopefulness of this day by lifting our voices together and singing the great Easter hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today. Let's make that an anthem of hope as we conclude this morning. Melinda, lead us, and then we'll be done. <laughs>